As a hospital CEO, I'm often asked to talk about or comment on the impact of healthcare reform on our region or nation's future. Without a doubt, our healthcare reimbursement and delivery systems must change. We're reaching a point where nearly 20% of our nation's GDP is now devoted to healthcare costs, costs which are skyrocketing. And continued increases will pull even more resources away from other valuable community services such as education and infrastructure. Medicare is projected to be insolvent by the year 2026, about the time most of us are going to need it. So the need for change is both compelling and urgent. But there's another threat looming, an iceberg of epidemic proportions which is threatening to capsize our nation's healthcare system. And that epidemic is childhood obesity. Now we can rearrange the deck chairs, if you will, on our healthcare system by fighting over how to redistribute funding, by debating over whether to increase taxes, cut services, delay eligibility. But if we do not get a handle on childhood obesity, no amount of legislative reform enacted will be able to cover the costs from the chronic diseases that stem from childhood obesity. In the future, we may very well look back and consider childhood obesity to be the most important health crisis of our time. The stakes are enormous. The challenge is monumental. The antidote is obvious, healthy eating and exercising more. But as we know, just making that declaration hasn't resulted in even negligible change. There is already so much that our federal and state governments, that our communities, our cities, our organizations, and our schools are doing to combat childhood obesity. We've increased our focus on education. New policies have been enacted and established in, in public schools in California, limiting the amount of soda and junk foods that our young children can have. There's a, a renewed interest in promoting the value that breastfeeding has in the prevention of childhood obesity. And I applaud and support all of these efforts and wholeheartedly back them and expect that if we put even more resources and energy behind them, we'll begin to see, see impact. But these actions alone are not enough. Reports released just last week have confirmed that we have not begun to bend the curve on this critical epidemic. My goal in the next few minutes is to share with you 10 very simple, very specific, and easily doable ideas that every single one of us can begin doing today within our communities, our organizations, and with our children and families. 10 small yet powerful ideas that have the potential to reduce obesity. Because you can't spin these facts. In 1990, all states had rates of obesity less than 15%. 20 years later, only one state, Colorado, has an obesity rate that's less than 20%. And before we get excited about Colorado, its rate was actually 19.8%. And if we were rounding, well, you get the picture. For children, the statistics are alarming. A third of the children in the United States are obese or overweight, nearly triple the rate from just a few decades ago. More than half of children from low socioeconomic neighborhoods are now considered obese or overweight. And obese children are much more likely to become obese adults. The impact on a child's emotional and physical well-being is startling. We've seen a staggering increases, increase in chronic diseases such as hypertension, heart disease, joint problems, sleep apnea, asthma, and diabetes, conditions that in the past were only associated with adulthood. Add to that the growing prevalence of social and psychological issues such as depression, discrimination, and poor self-esteem. We are, for the first time in modern history, on the verge of raising a generation of young people who will not live as long nor be as productive as their parents. 
And of course, there is growing financial impact of the chronic diseases and the lost productivity associated with obesity. It's easy to identify the causes of this epidemic. De epidemic. Lack of daily physical activity, a shortage of safe and appealing places to play. Less than half of children in California get the recommended amount of exercise every day. The proliferation of media and electronic devices. For each hour of TV watching, the risk of childhood obesity increases by 12%. Children consume 500% more sugar and soda today than in 1970. What you and I called a large soda when we were growing up is now labeled small, and it's sold with unlimited refills. The explosion and the availability of calorie-dense, nutritionally poor foods in supersized portions has contributed to our nation's obesity epidemic and has a major impact on children. It is estimated that children are exposed to 10,000 advertisements every year the vast majority of them promoting fast food, soft drinks, or sugared cereals. We know that childhood obesity is a complex and complicated problem. We know what, we know why, we know how obesity now and how childhood obesity will in the future affect our nation. And as I said moments ago, we already know what to do, healthy eating and exercising more healthy eating, and exercising more. It seems so simple, so why is it not working? Perhaps it's about how we're trying to change and not as much about lack of knowledge or willpower. Sure, knowledge and willpower are important, but they only get us partway to lasting change. This cartoon may help to illustrate further. A man and a woman are sitting on the deck of the Titanic and the man's reading his horoscope, which says, Water dominates, dress warm as you enter a chilly phase, lifeboats are important after the 14th, ha ha. These things are always so vague. <laughs> so healthy eating and exercising more. It's a great goal, but it's just too vague a statement to create change. Of course, the recommendations for exercise have become more specific over the past years. I was going to ask you to raise your hands if you knew that we were all recommended to get at least 30 minutes of exercise five days a week. But of course, if you were here earlier this morning, you heard Elizabeth's talk, and she told us all that. Of course, if you've already forgotten, you might want to go to her website. So. <laughs> now, I won't ask you to raise your hand if you're actually doing that. But if you're like most people in a recent study, more than half of us are not. So why not? Surely the instruction is specific enough. Why still not significant change? Perhaps it's too big a first step. Perhaps starting with a small step is more ha helpful to establish a habit. And habits, as we know, are the keys to change. True change can occur a number of ways. Unwanted change is often the result of crisis. But when people want to change, they often, or usually, turn first to the strategies of the drastic and the grand. We often want to sell, solve big, complex problems with equally big, comprehensive solutions. Sweeping legislation, mandates, large-scale programs, crash diets, cold turkey, for example. And sometimes these measures produce remarkable results. But most often, like New Year's resolutions, they fade by month's end. Effective and lasting change and can also occur, and some would argue more likely occur, when another strategy is employed. A strategy called Kaizen, which was first introduced to Japan by General MacArthur at the end of World War II. Kaizen is the philosophy of using specific and small, achievable steps toward improvement. This allows the desired habit to be more easily established and paves the way to the ultimate goal. The late, great John Wooden described his philosophy about conditioning by saying, and I'm going to paraphrase, when you improve a little each day, eventually big things occur. Not tomorrow, not the next day, 
but eventually a big gain is made. Seek the small improvements one day at a time. That's the only way it happens, and when it happens, it lasts. Now, I'm not suggesting at all that we abandon the big projects and initiatives that are already underway. And in fact, it would be great to put even more resources and energy toward them. But I am suggesting that today, we as individuals, beginning today, every single one of us in this room, can apply the Kaizen or small step strategy to the problem of childhood obesity. So what follows are 10 ideas worth sharing. 10 small steps that every single one of us could do today to reduce obesity and reduce childhood obesity. They aren't the only 10 steps, and the only magic about them is that they're small enough to do today, and they're backed by scientific study. So number one, as we heard earlier from Majora Carter, the community-based and co-op, not-for-profit gardens have begun to spring up across the Southland. They increase access to inexpensive, sometimes free, locally, produ locally grown produce. They provide education about healthy eating. They s create an opportunity for movement and exercise. And they often serve to beautify a previously vacant dirt lot. There are dozens of them in Southern California and clearly a need for more to be established, particularly in low-income neighborhoods. But in this, and some of us today may leave and be inspired to volunteer at one or even start one ourselves and that would be terrific. But in the spirit of small steps, taking a small, specific, achievable step that every single person in this room could do today, our first idea is to go home tonight and donate to a community garden. We've seen the emergence of biking and walking trails in our neighborhood and many fine programs like Safe Routes to School and Project Renew. We heard a fair amount from Charles Gandhi this morning. Again, in the spirit of small steps, another idea that we can each do right away is what I've labeled walk the lot. And what this means is starting with a simple habit of starting the habit of parking in the furthest corner of a parking lot every time you go to a shopping mall or store. Okay. Many organizations have instituted a Know Your Numbers program. While the first three numbers listed require a little more effort, we can each measure or calculate the last three listed. And contrary to popular opinion, recent studies have shown that people who weigh themselves frequently are more likely to lose unwanted weight and are better to able to keep weight off. Frequency is best determined, of course, to each individual, but the small idea here is that daily or weekly weighing facilitates weight loss. We spend the majority of our waking time at work. Some organizations are now offering on-site yoga and exercise classes, on-site gyms and health clinics, stand-up or walking workstations, and we hope that more organizations will follow suit. One small practice that we can all implement at work, starting Monday, is to conduct walking meetings. You burn 15 calories an hour while sitting. Well, we haven't burned too many today. <laughs> but you burn 200 calories an hour while walking. Long periods of inactivity, even sitting for more than a few hours, increase the risk of heart attack, even for people who exercise or eat well. It's been recommended that we all take 10,000 steps a day. And a pedometer is an easy way to monitor progress. Kids love these devices. It's a great way to get kids moving. Now, since a pedometer, I imagine, is not a common household item in your households, and since I promised to give you 10 ideas that you could start doing today, I brought along a supply of pedometers and will gift one to each of you. So just see me at the reception afterwards. <laughs> Children and adults who eat breakfast are more likely to lose weight and maintain a healthy weight. And those that frequently skip breakfast actually gain weight. If you or your children drink milk, switching to 1% milk can greatly reduce saturated fat. If you drink soda, Limit your, yourself to one soda a week, including diet. If that's too drastic a step, too big a first step, limit yourself to one a day. Probably everyone now knows that the food pyramid has been replaced by the food plate. This makes it much easier for portion and serving monitoring. Try replacing dinner plates with salad plates. 
We all also know it's best to eat at least five fruits and vegetables a day. Many of us may not be doing that. So my reference here to an apple a day isn't meant to be old fashioned, but to illustrate that perhaps being even more specific, starting even smaller, is necessary to form a habit. Reducing TV watching has been repeatedly suggested and repeatedly ignored. <laughs> One small specific idea here is to exercise during commercials. Make it a condition with your kids of watching commercials. Jumping jacks at every commercial. And 10, my personal favorite. <laughs> Studies show that people who get five hours or less of sleep, less, of sleep, less sleep at night, are actually more likely to pack on extra weight. And those who sleep more than seven hours are less likely to be obese. So for those not getting enough of sleep, and I would imagine many people in the room, in the specific small step recommendation is to go to bed one hour earlier than usual. I hope that I've provided information and inspiration and that these 10 small steps will help you and your families thrive. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you today.